Good morning and welcome to Oasis Sunday morning online service. We always want to remind and encourage everyone that watches to say hello and good morning and greet one another in the comments below this video. And while you do that, check out some announcements that we have for this week. Our food pantry is currently running on a bi-weekly basis. Our next food share will be October 3rd and it will be from 10.30 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. We are still asking that everyone who shows up to please wear a mask and remain socially distant from all others who are also present. If you or anyone you know needs food desperately in between food shares, please feel free to reach out to us. We often have an overabundance from each share and tend to store it at the church, and we want to be able to help our community in any way that we can when they need it. You can reach us through message on Facebook, or you can email or call our church office, and all of that info can be found here on our Facebook page or our website. For our members who financially contribute to the church, there is two digital options for you to be able to continue to give during this time. If you go to our website and click on the Give tab, you will see both digital options there. You can give online or give by text. Those will further explain how to do that on both pages of the website. You'll also see a third option for giving, and that is to give by mail. You can address a check to Oasis at Conway Gardens and send it to us through the mail. You can find our address on our website under the Give tab. We do want to thank every person that contributes to the church. We know this is a hard time to give, and we are grateful and appreciative of every dollar that you contribute. Contributing to the church means we are able to keep our doors open and continue serving our community. We are adding a prayer service to our Facebook page on Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. This is just a time for us to pray over the needs of our members, our community, our nation, and our world. If you have any requests you would like prayed over in the video, you can comment them in this video comments or send us a private message through Facebook. We hope you'll join us for a quick time of prayer this Thursday at 6 p.m. We never want to push a political or government agenda here at Oasis, but today we do want to say a brief reminder to fill out the 2020 census. We believe it's important because it affects the neighborhoods and the communities that we care about and that we are a part of. The deadline has been extended to October 31st for this year, and you can fill it out at my2020census.gov. Don't forget to stay connected with us through social media. You can see regular updates on our Facebook page, Oasis at Conway Gardens. You can see our live videos on Sunday mornings through Facebook and through our YouTube channel. And you can see all of the past sermons in our online service playlist on all three of our social media accounts, our Facebook page, our website, and our YouTube channel. Thank you again for joining us this week for our message. We hope you enjoy the message and the time of music, and we hope to see you here again next week. Good morning, Oasis. This morning we're going to sing I Saw the Light, fun song, and then we're going to go into a song of deliverance. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I wonder so aimless by my fear.
Hi, I'm Eric Loudermilk, and I serve as the interim pastor at Oasis at Conway Gardens Church in Orlando, Florida. Welcome to our service this September 27th morning, 2020. I saw the most beautiful image this week that I've seen in a long time, and man, did it really stir me. You see, Dave Donaldson passed away. Dave was a member of our church. Uh, Dave was 85 years of age, and he passed away this Saturday morning. Wednesday, we did the funeral, and we moved to the grave for the graveside service. And I, you have to, in your mind's eye, imagine that I am positioned to the left of everyone, to the left of the casket speaking to the, the crowd, and the casket is to my left, and it's I can look down the length of it. And uh, I don't remember how cloudy it was. Um, I'm looking out my window now, and there are some clouds, but I have the distinct image in my mind of at the moment of this image being very blue in the sky. And I'm looking down the casket, and at the end of the graveside service, uh, as they have lowered Dave's casket into the grave, they invited family to come forward and if they have a flower to drop it into the drop it down into the casket to say their last goodbyes. And uh, it came time for surely Dave's wife to come up and do this. 
And Shirley was vocal at this time, calling out Dave's name. She's not, um, as you might think, out of control. Uh, not that I would be judgmental of that, but I'm trying to give you a picture of the sweetness of the moment of her saying, goodbye, Dave, goodbye. And she comes up to the casket and she's been crying and she has the most beautiful, large, perfectly formed rose. And from my angle to the side, looking down and seeing her leaning over the casket, the rose was just, it stood out crisp red. And as she'd been crying and she kissed the rose and as she dropped it in, a very large tear fell simultaneously with it into the casket. As she said, goodbye, Dave. Goodbye, honey. I'll see you soon. You know, grief is a beautiful thing, especially when it's based in love. Now, if you've not experienced that, that might sound odd to you. But I was discussing this with uh, another recently widowed lady in our church. And when I said that, she says it sure is. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. As she said goodbye to Dave, said goodbye to her lover, and said, I will see you soon. Today's service is dedicated to Dave Donaldson. We're putting an image up right now of Dave in his Air Force uniform. Dave was a man who heeded the call of God's love and God's grief in sending his son to die for Dave. And we're going to talk today about how the Corinthian church was being reminded of that love by the Apostle Paul. Let's get started. For our scripture reading today, turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. That's Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. And it's going to be in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, then 2 Corinthians. Eighth book in the New Testament. We're more than halfway through your entire Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. While you're turning there, let me remind you that this entire uh, series is about Corinth, the church at Corinth being a very stormy church, lots of storms in this church. And the first letter that we still have of Paul writing to that church, remember we think there probably were about four letters, we have two of them. The first letter is a lot of Paul correcting some of these problems. He's rebuking them. He's scolding them. They have a lot of pride. They're boasting. They're arguing over who the best teacher is and who they're loyal to. And while all that's going on, they're completely um, numb to the fact that they have some pretty gross sexual sin in their church as well. There's other problems as well, but the point is that first letter is all about correcting that storminess. The second letter, as we mentioned last week, has a lot more of the word comfort in it. It's a follow-up letter of uh, soothing after correction, but I want to point out to you today in our reading that everything's still not quite right. Okay, so are you there? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Let's read a couple verses here. Paul says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been open wide to you. Our affection for you is not restricted, but you are restricted in your affections for us. Now, as a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts to us also. Now, that was the New English translation, which I'm using in this series, but I want to read this out of the contemporary English version, which I think captures the personal relationship between Paul and his associates and the people in the church and just the relational nature of the passage. So here's that passage again from 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13 in the contemporary English version. Friends in Corinth, we are telling you the truth when we say there is room in our hearts for you. We're not holding back on our love for you, but you're holding back on your love for us. 
I speak to you as I speak to you as my own children. Please make room in your heart for us. So while 2 Corinthians is a letter of comfort, there's still some more reconciliation needing to going on in that relationship. Now, what's that have to do with today's message? Well, as a part of that plea for completely clearing the way for love between them, Paul reiterates to them the passion, the love, and the heart of the story and proclamation of Jesus. He reiterates to them the passion, the love, the heart, and the proclamation of Jesus, God's love for us and his grief when we don't respond to him. Now I'm going to back up a few verses, just about a page maybe in your Bible, to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. And this is really the heart. What I just read to you earlier is explaining why he's pushing this. This is the heart of today's message. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making his plea through us. We plead with you, and literally in Greek, that is, we beg you, we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Let me repeat that last phrase, and I'm going to make explicit who him is. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. I want to return to that image of Shirley's large, perfectly formed red rose and a large crystal clear drop of tear set against the blue crystal sky. Again, I don't think Hollywood could have done this better. It was just one of those surreal moments. I want you to keep that image in your mind as that tear and the rose fall into the casket portraying Shirley's grief and her deep love for Dave. Keep that in your mind. And I want to take you for a moment to the movie Passion of the Christ, where the life and story of Jesus is portrayed. His birth, his miracles that demonstrate he is indeed God's divine son, both the son of God and God himself at once. And towards the end of the movie, Jesus is tried and condemned to death, while the authorities don't realize this, in the grand scheme of God's world, Jesus is taking on the sins of all of humanity, all those terrible mistakes humanity has made, and bearing that sin. He's becoming sin, as Paul just told us on the cross. As he's hanging on the cross, bloodied and bruised after having been beaten by a Roman cat of nine tails, a whip with nine leather thongs on it, tipped with metal and glass and bone that whips into the body of the, of the prisoner and the flesh is ripped away. And after a thorough beating, often organs and muscle tissue are showing. Picture Jesus hanging on the cross and the camera angle changes to pointing downward from the sky. You're like looking down from heaven. And you can see the soldiers on the ground moving around, and it's sort of bluish white because of the sand and the sky reflecting. And then suddenly, slowly, what you're looking through begins to waver as if you're looking through water. And then you see that it's a tear, that you're looking through someone's eye, and the tear drops to the earth and falls on Jesus' body or next to his bloody body. You see, the movie makers are portraying the grief and the love that God has. The grief over the separation God feels between himself and his divine son. And I think the separation God feels over the separation of us from him. But yet the irony is all of this is an effort to reconnect God and mankind. So while Shirley's 
image was representing the grief and the despair of separation. God's is not only a separation, but in an act to reconnect us to himself. The writer John tells us in his story of Jesus, God loved the world so much that he gave his son, his only son, so that, who, so that whoever puts their trust in him, in his life and his forgiveness, won't perish but have everlasting life. It was out of love and grief over this broken relationship now, what do I mean about grief over this continued broken relationship? Well, we don't have time to go too deep in it today, but I want to give you a quick summary of that from the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, or as Jews call it, the Hebrew Bible. Some of these stories you may know. Initially, God puts man and his and Adam and Eve uh, in the garden. I started to say man and his woman, but I, I meant to say man and woman, but anyhow. Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they have all these choices, and there's one choice they shouldn't make, and they make it. And God does drive them from the garden, but look, he comes back to Adam and Eve, and he makes them clothing. I want you to think of humanity as an infant, overall humanity as an infant, and humanity messes up. I often tell my students this is like a baby pooping in a sandbox or pooping in their diaper. Well, that's okay when humanity's that young. And God comes in and makes new garments for them. But then later, one of the other stories you may know, uh, Noah, uh, God starts over with humanity, says Noah's the one righteous man and one righteous family. But if you looked at what happened after Noah gets off the boat, after the great flood, Noah plants a vineyard, has a little too much to drink, and one of his sons commits a sexual sin with him. You see, Humanity's a little older and is in a larger garden now or a larger sandbox. He's old enough to know better. And even though God's taught him, he's pooped in the sandbox again. A little later in the Old Testament, God makes another promise, a covenant, with a man named Abraham. And this one is specifically to bless the rest of the earth. All the families in the earth will be blessed through you. And as a part of that, God says, I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. I've got your back. I'll even give you this land. Have you ever noticed what Abraham does? He leaves the land. He doesn't trust God. He lies to another man and puts his wife in the arms of another man. Cowardice and deception. In fact, Abraham does this twice. And in between that time, he sleeps with another woman because he doesn't believe God at first to provide him a child through his wife. So humanity is now like 15 or 16 in the grand scheme of things, and humanity is still making a mess in the garden, making a mess in the sandbox. Does God wipe his hands of humanity and walk away? No, God so loved the world that he continues to come back to humanity. God could have given up then, but he doesn't. Hundreds of years later, God makes a, another promise, another covenant with a man named Moses and a nation he's picked to tell his story. And he gives this nation 10 major rules. And actually, if you read closely, there's 16, 613 other rules as to how to keep those. Those 10 rules are the 10 commandments. And the 613 are the Jewish laws in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible to keep them. And Moses' people, Israel, they say, yes, sir, we'll keep this, this deal, this promise. And God says, if you do, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. But they don't keep the rules. In fact, as soon as Moses comes down from the mountain with these stone tablets, with these rules, they're already forsaking God and worshiping images made from gold. Fast forward, God makes another promise. Yes, God doesn't completely turn away from humanity or the nation of Israel. He comes and makes another uh, uh, promise, a covenant, through a very important king named David. And says, David, if you'll keep my promises and you'll do as I've said, I'll keep your family on the throne, and through you I'll continue to redeem humanity. And even David, who's supposed to be a man after God's own heart, 
commits premeditated murder, premeditated adultery. And after him, the kingdom just spirals out of control, splits in two. His son Solomon worships hundreds of idols. Uh, his son, Solomon's son, uh, rebels. The kingdom splits in half. Both sides of the kingdom fall into such deep sin and wrongdoing that they're conquered by other nations. Seventy years later, God brings them out of these conquering times, or brings some of them out, and they reaffirm uh, that covenant, the covenants that had happened, especially with Moses, and they say, hey, we'll, we'll obey the rules again. And they don't. They don't. So by the end of the story, you see how many times God could have walked away from humanity. God could have walked away from humanity making a mess in the sandbox. But now humanity's old. God's been working with them all this time. That's what the Old Testament story is. That's what the Hebrew Bible story is. So then we get to the New Testament, and we get the new promise, the new covenant. Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And what's that covenant? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And ever since Wednesday at Dave's funeral, I've just had these two images on my mind and this comparison on my mind between Shirley's love and grief for Dave portrayed in that rose and that tear dropping against a pure, clear blue sky into the casket and the scene in Passion of the Christ and God's tear falling to earth and landing on the bloody body of Jesus. You see, he loved us so much that he was willing to encounter deep grief for us. He sent his son Jesus, who was God himself, to die. He loved us so much, he was willing to bear the grief of that separation with Jesus, to fix the grieving separation he feels with us, in order to reconnect us to him. Why would God do that? because he loves us so much. Just like Shirley's love for Dave over 67 years, God's love and grief is still so strong. And he's been pursuing us for so long. And it's breaking his heart that you won't open your heart wide open to him. I was sitting across the counselor <clears throat> licensed clinical counselor. I'd been seeing her for a few months. I'd gone through a pretty severe bout of depression. I don't know how to rate it, but my wife, Patty, thought I was suicidal. I wept two or three times a week. I just finished 11 and a half years of doctoral study, burning the candle at both ends. And my counselor said to me, I think it's about time, Eric, for you to repent for trusting in your own righteousness. I think it's about time that you ask God's forgiveness for trusting in your own self and your own supposed good works for achieving peace with God. The Mayo Clinic defines uh, cortisol depletion as the long-term activation of the stress response system and the overexposure to cortisol and other stress hormones that follow, which can disrupt almost all of your body's processes. I was in a later stage of cortisol depletion in my body. I had built and burnt the candle at both ends to finish my doctorate studies, keeping down a full-time job while also putting 20, mostly 30 hours a week in the library studying while also trying to keep my family intact. And it had taken a toll. You see, in order to finish my degree, my life had become a little bit like these bookshelves in the background, except instead of one long shelf, I want you to imagine many little bitty shelves, little cubby holes. And I had to order my life by putting each little piece of my life in its cubbyhole box, 
I had to keep it organized. I had to get up at a certain hour. I had to get to work early so I could get off work early and spend four hours in the library and go home and spend it reading a nighttime story to my son. I had to have a certain date with my wife on a certain day. And it took its toll. And I began to transfer those cubby holes into my spiritual life. My life had to be this way. I had to not make these mistakes. And over time, I slipped into a works of righteousness, a righteousness of works. It all depended on me being good all the time. And any sinful thought, any sinful slip up meant that was out of God's favor. And it took several months before my counselor felt that she had built enough rapport to me with me that she could tell me it's time for you to repent for trusting in your righteousness. Second Corinthians 5 21 became to me a very important verse that day. And it's really the anchor verse around which we're making this whole message. He made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness. Notice that Paul doesn't say so that we could taste the righteousness of God or dip our little toe in and get some benefit of the righteousness of God or to take part in it. No, God made Jesus to be sin. He made him sin. All of humanity sin. That's when that big tear fell from heaven. Why did he do it? So that he could make Eric louder milk. The righteousness of God. Michael Green in his book, uh, But Don't All Religions Lead to God, says that the Christian claim is that God shrinks himself to become a fertilized egg in a little girl's womb. What great effort God takes to reach out to us. And then he grows into a man and then humbles himself, as Philippians 2 tells us, Paul tells us, that Jesus humbles himself to the most barbaric form of death in those days, death on the cross. The apostle Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. Crucifixion was reserved for barbarians. Romans were too good for it. Why did he do that? So that we might become the righteousness of God. You see that big tear falling down from heaven? Like Shirley's rose and her tear her love for Dave. God's been pursuing us for so long and it's breaking his heart that you won't open your heart wide for him. Is it time for you to stop trusting in your own righteousness? Or maybe another way to put it to me at that time and to put it to you. Is it time for you to stop fretting over your broken righteousness because it'll never be good enough? Isn't it time for you to repent and throw yourself on his righteousness? One of the reasons many don't believe the story of Jesus is because that it seems to be too good to be true. It's crazy love to steal the line from the title of Francis Chan's book. The New Testament called it good news. Well, I've often said that it's such stinking good news that people have trouble believing it. Won't you listen to us today as we beg you? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, as ambassadors of Christ, we beg you. The Greek word there is beg. We beg you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled from God. Don't trust in your own behavior. And many, like myself, have made that shift. They thought they were trusting in God's righteousness, but they were trusting in their own. John Wesley was a missionary in America, and he didn't get it. It was on a boat back to England on a, a ship ride with Moravians. Then he realized that he wasn't trusting in God's righteousness. And that's what that tear from heaven in the passion of Christ portrays. God's pursuit over us and his grief over the pain that it takes to pursue us. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Earlier in this chapter in Paul's letter, Paul says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be paid back according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or evil. But notice that is 10 verses before this key verse. 
he made him to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. If you surrender your life today, the deeds that will be displayed when you get to heaven and sit in front of the judgment seat of Christ, when you are lowered into the casket, as our dear brother Dave was, the deeds that will be evaluated before God will be the blood of Christ, not the deeds that you've done on earth. Later on in the next chapter, Paul says that today is the day of salvation. Now is the right time. Billy Graham was so famous for saying that in his sermons. This Sunday morning is the time for you to finally give up, to finally quit saying, I've got to have my way, and realize that the only way to peace with God is to finally give up, to give up your will, and accept his forgiveness for you today. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, and I'm going to repeat this prayer, and I ask those at home who are making this decision or recommitting themselves to this grace as I was to pray after me. Father, I know that I am not good enough in myself. The Bible calls me a sinner. And yet the Bible tells me that you became flesh in the form of your son, and you died and became my sin so that I could have peace with you. I accept that forgiveness today. Come into my life. Come into my life so that when I am laid in a casket, in my body and in my spirit, I come face to face with you. You will see the blood of Jesus. Your love shed for me. I ask you to come into my life today and make me a new creation. And I will do my best to grow and to learn and to follow you, but trusting in your righteousness, not my own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today with us for the first time or as a recommitment of trusting in Jesus' forgiveness, would you let us know? You can reach us through our Facebook page or on our church web, web page, oasisconwaygardens.org. You can see our phone number and you can email us there. We'd like to talk with you and encourage you on your journey. Have a good week.